Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here, whether you're joining us here in the room or watching us online. We're happy that you were able to make it. My name's Rob Kroll. I'm the program director for the internet marketing degrees here at Full Sail University. And I'm going to be hosting this, this event, which is called Five Things You Need to Do in 2015 for Your Social Media Presence. Um, so please put your hands together and help me welcome our distinguished panelists. Um, starting on the far end, Glenn Austin Anderson. <clears throat> Glenn's an award-winning documentary director and social media journalist from Arlington County, Virginia. He's currently the senior producer for social news and streaming video for BBC News in the US. Before joining the BBC, Glenn spent a decade working as a freelance and staff producer journalist at publications including Military.com, CBS College Sports, Financial Times, The Guardian, and Runner's World. His work has taken him from college football fields in the deep south of the United States to refugee camps in Haiti and war zones in Afghanistan. His 2009 documentary series about injured New York firefighter Matt Long earned him a Webby's People's Voice Award for Best Sports Video. In 2014, he partnered with the BBC's 24-hour global news channel, BBC World News, to release the self-financed documentary film To Remember. Glenn is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Oxford, and the NYU Tisch Graduate Film Program. So welcome, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Next is Janelle Ferrer. Janelle graduated with her MA in Entertainment Business from Full Sail as valedictorian. <laughs> And also has a BA in Mass Communications from Southeastern University. She has over 12 years experience in the media communications, hospitality, and event management industries, and three years experience creating social media analyses for companies to improve their social media reach. Janelle is a course director here at Full Sail University where she teaches media communication project management. Welcome, Janelle. And last but not least, Lucas Ferrer graduated with his undergrad in marketing from Southeastern University in 2006. He spent the next four years in traditional marketing while incorporating elements of search engine optimization as the marketing world evolved. After that, he started focusing solely on the emerging world of internet marketing, taking the leap to join Full Sail University and complete his master's in internet marketing in 2014. He's now at a boutique marketing firm taking a more holistic approach to the ever-broadening meaning of SEO. Welcome, Lucas. All right, so this session is going to cover the use of social media both as individuals and as corporate entities, but we're mostly going to be focusing on the personal elements of it. Um, so, uh, but do be aware that some of the things that we talk about are applicable whether you're talking about a, a brand or you as a personal brand. Um, so, panelists, let's start with this question. You know, there are hundreds of different kinds of social media platforms out there. Um, should an individual or an organization be on all of them? And if not, how do they choose the right platforms for them? I'll start. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I even especially when you guys look at your own brands, there are so many platforms out there, but that doesn't mean you need to be on every single one of them. The more you're on, the more you can spread yourself thin. And especially if you're the only one updating your own stuff, you may not even get that done. Your audience is not always on every single platform. So a way that you can do that is by researching who your audience is, know who's listening on the other side, and what do you want to target? <clears throat> so you may want to do Facebook and Twitter. Pinterest may not be for your business. You've got to know who your target market is. Um, and the same applies. I think all of you guys need to be on LinkedIn, especially as students. That's somewhere definitely as a professional you need to be on. Um, but not everybody needs to be on Tumblr. Not everybody needs to be on StumbleUpon or Snapchat. And I know all of you guys are probably on Snapchat. But for your brand, there's, there's certain avenues and certain platforms that I think are really going to represent your brand to the best of its ability. So it's all about research and understanding who your audience is. I'd venture to say more. Uh, I'd venture to say more is not necessarily better. Um, there was a while there, and it sort of slowed down in the last six months, where like 
there seemed to be a new hot social platform every three weeks mm -hmm. that everybody would get excited about for about four days and then never log on to again after about a week. Um, and that seems to have slowed down. And you know, there's always going to be the big three, in my humble opinion, and that's um, Twitter, Facebook, and this one might surprise people, YouTube is a social platform. Right. It is not a video platform, it is a social platform. Uh, to a lesser extent, G+. After that, I see like the relative value of platforms on an overall sense decreasing. Pinterest is a very kind of interesting territory. The people who are into Pinterest really love Pinterest. Uh, it's very hard for brands to gain traction on Pinterest. I'll tell you which ones do really well. Home and Garden, those magazines, anything DIY that your brand is that and you're an active blogger and you want to do crafting and you want it, those people make a killing on ads because it all links to their blog. But you've got to know your brand. That may not be for everybody. I don't know a lot of musicians who do very well on Pinterest. Again, know your brand. I don't yeah. know people who go there to tag that stuff. And I, I obviously excluded Instagram because for one big reason is the lack of a link back. Uh, it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't generate traffic. I still think it's an awesome space. It's just uh, not a space with that link. Um, I, I understand their rationale for not doing it, but um, I don't think it's one of the major players because of the lack of that. Um, ultimately, the, living in reality, one of the big functions of social media is to drive traffic back to a website. And I don't think anyone's going to debate that. So um, I think Instagram is very cool and I'm eager to see where it goes. As far as the instant communication uh, platforms, uh, the Snapchats, I still think it's too young to totally invest in. Some big news brands, my part of the industry, are investing in it, and they're doing some really cool stuff. I just, uh, uh, I, I wanna see where it goes. Um, I think th there has to be measured excitement with new platforms. Is the dominant platform not invented yet? It has, you know, some dorm room geek not come up with the next great platform yet. Um, you know, we've all seen the social network and saw how that came about. Um, but I think uh, there could be something to come along and swipe this all off the, the face of the earth. And in our last session, I actually referenced Friendster. Now I'm gonna feel really old if no one in the room knows what Friendster is. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, for a while there, Friendster was, that, that was awesome but it, it, it certainly lived out its days. As I understand it, it's very popular still in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, um, but it's sort of disappeared off the rest of the social media landscape. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Lucas, um, Glenn mentioned Google Plus. So I think um, from a, a general standpoint, I think a lot of people think Google Plus is a, a barren wasteland. Um, but you would have a different reason for considering Google Plus to be an important platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> dealing with small businesses, and, and again, this applies to personal brands. Um, you know, Google still dominates the search engine market with uh, 64 percent, you know, and change. Uh, so, um, Google uses their platforms and ranks theirs highly. So, if, if you have your brand, your business on a, a Google Plus, uh, and then the business listings. Um, that's going to be one of the top uh, searches that comes up when you type in your name or a brand or even keywords, you know, that you might be trying to rank for. So um, it definitely affects organic search volume. So it's something that it's, it's necessary. Uh, it may not be something that a lot of people are using, uh, but again, just for uh, organic search volume, it, it's a must. And because of the, the corporate ownership structure, um, if you are doing stuff on YouTube, you should definitely have a G plus just because it, you can link it, them. You can link them, yeah. and um, you know it, it's low hanging fruit. Uh, you can build an audience that's uh, that or very quickly that way on the virtue of one being good or the other being good. So I, I also want to clarify something that. Um, that you mentioned earlier that people may not understand why Instagram may not be as much value. You always want to link back to a source of revenue or why you exist on social media. So when he's saying that you can't link back, he's talking about websites or YouTube or something where there's actually content there that you want direct people to direct people back to. So that's really important to understand if the social media platform that you utilize does not do that, then it's not really serving its function except just to be social. 
So that's what he's talking and, about. And that, in the same breath, that's sort of the beauty part of Instagram right, too. I, I, I love the platform. I just, I don't think right now it's a space necessarily for people who are with what the mission is here right, or like exactly. individually branding. I, um, you know, it, it, the, I, I'm eager to see where that goes. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best way to put it. Great, thank you. And let me just circle back around to the YouTube comment. Most of you probably know, but in case not all of you do, Google owns YouTube. So, you know, your content on YouTube is probably viewed more favorably mm -hmm. than your content on Vimeo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm glad you, you said something earlier that I liked about treating social media less like a TV channel and more like a TV set. Yeah, um, that, that, I think that quote's gonna haunt me for the rest of my uh, <laughs> professional life, but it, it, mm. it's true because Twitter does, is not in the content business, they're in the platform business. Facebook is not in the content business, actually they're sort of moving into the content business and that's also a very interesting space, but predominantly is not in the content business. Uh, YouTube, uh, unapologetically, relies on you mm -hmm. to make their content. So um, if we're taking a 1950s, 1960s sort of parochial approach to this, you would think, uh, well, they're a TV set. They're a means to get content. So if you just sort of turn it on its head and say, I'm not good at Twitter, that means you're not good at content. Make your, and there's so much, uh, so many great, ways to produce content now. It's not this stripped down thing where you get just 140 characters worth of text. Yes, that's the text limit, but there's Vine videos, there's their longer form video product that they're they're launching. On Facebook, the Facebook video player, um, I don't know if you guys have just, as casual observers or students, it's gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. It's really good, and the numbers are phenomenal. Uh, YouTube goes to full 1080 HD right now. Um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you can, um, I got a, uh, uh, my in-laws got us a big screen TV for Christmas. We can just throw up YouTube clips up onto the big screen TV. They look amazing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, it, it don't just, and that's just speaking of video. Let, let's talk about photo. Um, it, it link to your Instagram from your Twitter. Again, there's something problematic there, but uh, great photos, photo galleries. You can now put four photos in a tweet. Um, you can tell a whole photo story. Uh, I think there's so much potential in infographics and animated graphics. So don't just think of this like 140 characters or a short salient post. There's as much content as you can create, and it doesn't matter what that content is, audio, video, photo, uh, long form um, writing. Uh, do you guys know Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs? Mm -hmm. His Facebook feed is awesome. It's, he writes like essays. They're, they're like three page long essays. And if you like Mike Rowe and you like his attitude and you like what he kind of talks about, I never thought when I signed up for Facebook that I would be reading long form essays from a TV host. But it works for him, so. You should all go file, uh, follow Mike Rowe. So. <laughs> all right, thanks Glenn. All right, so now panelists, let's get into the five things. and. If you're lucky, we may get more than five, but there will be no extra charge. <laughs> um, the first thing that we, that we decided collectively on was consistency. So can you each talk a little bit about why consistency is important and in what ways you can <clears throat> maintain consistency? Well, the first, I think, is on how often you post. If you post once a month, it's not cutting it. Um, followers are very fickle, especially on Twitter they will unfollow you just as fast as they follow to you. If you're spamming them and you're posting things that are irrelevant to what your brand is, or you're just posting too much about yourself, that doesn't interest you guys. Millennials are not interested in that stuff. They're inter you're interested in what interests you, not what that person is. And so they need to be genuine. You need to be genuine with what you're posting and consistent in what you're doing with your brand, following other people who are like-minded, that you can repost those things. And you need to make sure that you're doing it on a consistent basis. So. So consistency follows different things, consistent to your brand and consistent in time. Know when to post. Every industry is very different. I've talked about, you know, the best times to post are such and such and such and such. And when I did an actual session on this, someone said, well, you know what, in California for comic books, the best time to post is, you know, if you're in the comic industry, it's Saturday at 9 a.m. I'm like, what? I would never post on Saturday at 9 a.m. That doesn't make any sense. 
know your industry. Look at, look at who's following. Look at where the engagement is happening, what the times are. That's when you want to be posting. That's when you want to be communicating with the people following you guys. Uh, yeah. It's a bit like a sort of really huge digital cocktail party. If you show up too early, there's no one no there one to there. talk to, and you're just kind of standing in the corner. And if, you're, if you show up too late, the party's already gone, all the hors d'oeuvres are eaten. So uh, timing is, um, is uh, absolutely huge. Uh, I, you know. Yeah, I want to bring it back um, a little more to a little more elementary point. Uh, consistency, having the same handle across everything. Um, you may have a Twitter profile, John, and then your Facebook profile is Crazy John or you know, Crazy something else. You, know, you, you want to be consistent across the, um, all the platforms so that you're getting your personal brand across, you know, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. I think a certain amount of patience is involved, too. Like, I've had uh, colleagues at the various places I've worked be like, I signed up for Twitter, I tweeted three times the first day, and I only have eight followers, I'm giving up. I'm not joking. This is like actually happened, and they're like, "Why don't I have 500 followers or 1,000 followers already?" And I'm like, "Well, it doesn't work like that." So, um, if you do three tweets a day or 30 tweets a day, whatever 30 might be a little uh, overkill, but okay. you do um, X, Y, Z number of tweets a day over a month, two months, you'll get traction. Follow those hashtags. Recognize what the conversations are going on. Um, go to events like. In our last uh, little group session, we, um, I was talking about how there's hashtags all over this building. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at one right now, full sale on air. You guys are all looking at one right now. So it's, um, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, you know, pay attention to what we're saying. But if you have your phone out, you know, go write a tweet with the hashtag. Join the conversation. And something that Glenn actually said in the last, the last session we were in, get each other's handle. Communicate with each other. You guys are your best networking team. This is where you guys start. And that is something that is to your advantage. A lot of people don't have an audience this big. If you guys got everybody in this room and everybody online started following some of you guys, you guys would have a sick following just on Twitter alone. But now it's, so how do you post to keep this updated to make you guys stay? That's, that's the key. Because again, I've I followed people and then they get obnoxious on Twitter and I unfollow them just as fast. So make sure that you're keeping people's attention. Engage with them. I, I'm getting ahead of myself because I think that's one of our other points. <laughs> but yeah, consistency in when you post. That was a great segue. Number Sorry. two is engagement. <laughs> <laughs> well, this I can write a novel about. <laughs> you want to start, Glenn? <laughs> engagement is this like, um, how, do, how do I put this? When I, when I had my first professional job, I used to play buzzword bingo. And that was what I'd put like the eight buzzwords, like synergy and <laughs> uh, humanistic and all these things and like wait for like guest speakers to come in and just use all of those words. Uh, engagement is not a generic corporate consultant speech buzzword. Engagement is the whole point of what we're doing. And there's great examples of engagement, and there's um, bad examples of engagement. One I like to use is at the BBC, we put out a story about um, uh, a company that wants to buy cruise ships and park them off the coast of San Francisco to, and run some cables out to them, and they bring in foreign workers to work in the tech industry, and they would live on these cruise ships. And it, they, this was this like grand idea, and we did a whole story about it for a technology series that we do. And we put it out onto at BBC News US on Twitter, and in and amongst all the spam, in and amongst all the like people angrily writing what they feel about world events, someone asked a salient, relevant, uh, tangible question about that story. And what I did is I went and found the journalist. Uh, he's a friend of mine. I went and called the journalist who did that story and said, "Hey, this guy wanted to know." when they do come to the US, will they have to clear customs each time or will there be some sort of special arrangement? That's a smart question from an audience member or, or, or a reader in this case. So what we did is the journalist went back to his sources, got the answer to the question, and we tweeted him back the answer the next day. That is engagement. Mm -hmm. That is like creating a bond with your audience, creating a dialogue. And I think engagement, everybody has it as this like, we have engagement scores. It's likes plus comments right. divided by shares. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you know engagement when you see it. Yeah. You know good engagement when you see it. Um, 
you know, and it, speaking on a brand level, um, I used in this morning session, I don't know if any of you were there, I talked about how airlines use it for customer service issues. And when you can actually see something happen, that's very cool, that, that's very powerful, and it creates brand loyalty, so. And I've, I've had times where to call in 1-800 number for a bank issue, has, it's, everybody's experienced 1-800 numbers, they're miserable. The second I tweeted about it, I got, immediately got a response back. That's the same, the same thing, that's engagement. The brand is knowing how to engage. Now, on a different token, I want to talk about engagement in the content you guys post. You know, you guys share viral commercials all the time all the time. Those people have engaged you. Whoever created that marketing campaign has engaged you to the point that you share commercials. Think, think about that, that doesn't make any sense. 10, 15 years ago, we would have never shared a commercial. And one that I love to talk about is the Dove brand of the Beauty Within, and that campaign soared and has done amazing because they told a story. And we talk a lot in the MCBS program about being storytellers. That's how you engage your audience. People share funny videos and they share emotional videos. Those are the two main categories that things like to share. Think about things you share on Facebook with your friends. It's usually because it cracks you up or it makes you cry. So it's one or the other. That's what people want to see. You engage your audience by doing that. That's how they share. And you know the same thing. If they communicate with you and they, I love that video or where did you, something like that, answer, respond. Don't take too long to respond to the people following you. That's what you guys want is you want people to talk to you. You want people to communicate with you and don't wait for them to do it. On Twitter, we, we've talked about this several times today. If you guys are promoting something, you know, and so we had a DJ earlier and, you know, it was a St. Patty's Day, you know, club thing or something like that. And I said, well, look at who's posting on Twitter. Hey, any good place to go for St. Patty's Day? Then contact those people and say, hey, there's a great place. There's a great event going on and blah, blah, blah. Communicate. Be proactive. Reach the people you want to reach. That hits a great point, too, that I mentioned in one of the other sessions and that a lot of people forget. It's not just output. It's input too. And speaking as someone, and again, like I said this this morning, like I'm not speaking on behalf of the BBC here. I'm speaking as a social media professional who happens to work there. But we have an entire department dedicated to reading social media, looking for social media, looking for trends, looking for um, sources that exist on social media. We engage them in a conversation and use their material to supplement our work. This makes better journalism, and I know we're not talking strictly about journalism, but this makes better content is the way yeah. you guys should see it. So, um, you know, uh, I read an article on Sports Illustrated, uh, Sports Illustrated yesterday, the actual physical magazine, because I was in an airplane and my phone was out of, uh, out of battery, and I t the first thing I did when I landed was tweeted the writer and said this would make a great short film. Uh, this, uh, this story he did about an NBA player who got traded eight times in two months. It's a crazy story. And I'm like, this would make a really cool short film. He replied back to me, that's a cool idea. Maybe uh, when I get time to come up from air after this, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll write him a pitch and say, hey, let's talk about this. Things happen that way, guys. It really does. <laughs> And we were talking earlier about how people can get jobs on Twitter just making conversation like this. And one of our earlier panelists, she said that she got the, her current job talking about cartoons and music, and she happened to be talking to the VP of the company she now works for. This was a conversation on Twitter about something she enjoyed and did. You never know what's going to happen when you learn to engage with the people that are following you and the people you follow. You guys should be following industry experts in the industry you want to be in. So be proactive in that, follow them, engage with them, because if they're doing social media right, they're prompting you guys with questions. They're asking and they're saying, who's out there listening? Be the one to respond. You know, that's a huge way to be a step ahead. Yeah, you're building virtual relationships. Yeah. Um, again, you're building that trust. And um, I think going back to the first question, you know, what platforms, if not all, should I get on? You know, focus on a select few. When you spread yourself too thin, uh, kind of reiterating on what Janelle said, if you had a profile and you just left it vacant and people are engaging you still on it, those relationships, everything that you built up, you just created distrust. Because now you've abandoned uh, somebody that asked you a question, somebody that engaged with you, you just abandoned them. Um, and nobody wants that. I mean, and it, if you think about it in the real world, you don't want to be abandoned by your friends. Somebody's reaching out to you, they're trying to create a relationship, or they already have and you've abandoned them. So be consistent um, in your engagement. And active. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I always think of, of engagement ex exactly like that. You're at a party and someone walks up to you and you just turn around and walk away, right? That would be <laughs> super rude. Um, and you, but people do that all the time on social media and, and big brands do that all the time on social media too. And that creates major frustration for consumers who are trying to get answers. As Janelle said, when you're having the problem with the bank and you can't get through to their 800 number because you know, you're on hold for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you tweet to them and you do it politely, mm -hmm. um, you can often get a response much quicker. I had the exact same experience with a hosting company recently <laughs> where I tried five times to get through to them on the phone and was never able to, and I tweeted to them, and within five minutes, I mm -hmm. got a response because they know that everyone in the world can see that. Yep. Not everyone in the world knows I've been on hold for an right. entire <laughs> hour and a half over those five times. Um, so number three is relevance. Could I just make one quick comment? If you guys are ever really bored, just follow at Delta Assist and see all the people complaining about Delta <laughs> and then watching how they're trying to fix it. It's actually terribly entertaining, so please. <laughs> so relevance. <laughs> Ooh. That's a, uh, um, I'm gonna defer. Okay. <laughs> With relevance, I wanna say post things that are interesting. Post things that are today, and I, we talk about scheduled posts, and that's, that's a cheat, and that's fine, if it's relevant to that time as well. It doesn't make sense to schedule a Hall of Fame tweet in two months. It's outdated. So the same happens with content. Things change so fast. You guys are constantly getting new phones, new technology, new apps, new things. There's always new, new, new. So when you schedule posts in advance or you talk about things that are way outdated, it's gonna out, people are not going to follow you. They're not going to listen to you because they think that you're not up to speed on what you're talking about. So again, if I start talking about the Grammys now, I'm a little late. So make sure that you guys are relevant with what you guys are posting. Post interesting things. Post provocative questions, things about whatever it is about your brand that you think, hey, I'm gonna push the edge a little bit to see what response I get back. But post things that are relevant to you and to your audience. Your audience is following you because they believe in your brand or they believe in what you're talking about and they're interested. So make sure that you stay on topic. And I think that's especially true in the side of the social media business I'm in with uh, journalism and particularly journalism with a broadcaster. Um, I did the, an example this morning about um, yesterday's best performing story on the BBC World News Facebook page, which you should all go follow because it's awesome and the guy who runs it is a cool dude. Um, the, uh, the best story we had was about um, four countries trying to create their own little micro commonwealth for uh, free exchange of labor and free exchange of goods. That is incredibly dense and boring to the overwhelming majority of news consumers. But where the BBC and the Commonwealth countries are, uh, are used to be under British rule, this story did really, really well for us. So that is a story that they're not going to see on ABC News. It's a story they're not going to see on CNN. We spoke to our audience. And we know the geography of our audience. And one of the countries that was left out of that little foursome was India. We have a huge audience in India. So it sparked a huge conversation. It sparked a lot of sharing. We owned that story. And that's a very empowering feeling. And you can do the same thing as a brand. You can do the same thing as an individual. Um, right now, like we're all kind of like really into hashtag full sale HOF. But right now, the overwhelming majority of the country is talking about the NCAA basketball tournament. And there's apparently already been like three upsets. Uh, I'm a sports fan. That's the majority of my feed right now. That's not what I'm checking uh, but when I look down at my phone. But join the conversation. Be relevant. Be in the now. And it's especially useful if you have something to bring to it. Right. Um, what I, we're sort of taking a new strategic approach with um, archived content. And if we like, if we're doing a story about the 2016 elections and something about Hillary Clinton's uh, um, career as a senator comes up, well, we'll go and look at a story from uh, when she was a senator in New York that we might have in our archives that might be relevant to the conversation. So now we're taking content that's seven, eight, nine years old and repurposing it and giving it a new life. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Like, that's. We're part of the conversation, but we're, we're creating value. Mm -hmm. And we're creating value from our archive. Think that strategically about it. Contribute to the conversation, but try to contribute in the most unique way possible. So the next one, and Janelle, you, you again sort of 
led into that perfectly. Um, we talked about using tools, so a, sort of a variety of different tools, right? Scheduling posts or tweets, um, using hashtags effectively. How important is that? And um, you know, how much as personal brands should we be focusing on that? Well, I think there's so many tools out there that are great. I use Scoop It. I don't know if any of you guys have used it, but that's how I used to get a lot of my social media articles that I post on Twitter. Um, and I'll use them, and I even use them just to continue updating on what's going on in social media. Those are great aggregators that really help throw articles based on what you're looking for and whatever your industry is, is in. And so follow those people because they'll be sending you articles every single day and you, you can retweet those, you can talk about those. So that's just an easy avenue. Hashtags. Do not use these poorly. Spell check, for goodness sakes. Check your, your hashtags. If no one can find them, that was a wasted post. And so I've seen so many times where people misuse the hashtag. If you're not researching, it's very easy to research a hashtag. Just put it in the search engine and put in that exact hashtag. If it's trending something that you don't want to be associated with, do not use that in your post or you, that's how you will be found. So make sure that you're using the tools that are available accurately. Instagram uses hashtags. Facebook, they use them. It's not great. Pinterest, they don't know how to do it right yet. They've tried. It's working, but people don't look at things like that. So know which tools are used in what platform and how you can best utilize them. But, and don't over hashtag. If you have a post that's just hashtags, you're spamming. It's just obnoxious. <laughs> One of the best social media tools is grossly underutilized and everybody has it and it's not an outside service. It's Twitter list. Oh, that's true. Like, nobody uses Twitter lists the way they should. And, I, and I've said this at, like, journalism conferences, sitting next to people from Twitter. And I'm like, yeah. the list is awesome. Uh, you, um, uh, we have a rapper from Philadelphia here. I'm going to call you out because you were in our last <laughs> session. If I want to know about rap in Philadelphia, I go onto Twitter, I create a list, Philly rappers, and I have them all in one list. And uh, like, I can go to that list, and I can share that list and say, hey, is anybody else interested in this? And I've got it all in one place. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. News brands use this. Companies use this. For some reason, it's not latching on with individuals. Explore that space. And like, if you're a sports fan, my favorite basketball um, analyst, or my favorite basketball sites, whatever it is, just like, and it, it's a cool way to see the content that you're interested in, to curate the content yeah. that people are speaking to you about. Um, so that's one tool. I mean, there are hundreds of companies right now that are trying to say, we're the best people for aggregating tweets, and we're the best people for displaying tweets and everything. I, I think it, it's a matter of preference. Some of them charge very hefty fees, and I don't think that conversation is for this room right now. But be aware of those companies. And uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll try to write a tweet later with some of their names that are doing a really good job in the aggregation are really doing a good job in the metrics. I would say to um, use hashtags uh, appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, there's social media fails all the time and usually they result from uh, somebody using a hashtag um, inappropriately. I think DiGiorno did one recently where it's a hashtag I should have stayed. Um, why, why I stayed? Why I stayed, yeah, I yeah, stayed, yeah, yeah. And it's the domestic abuse, um, <laughs> it basically, you know, that's what it dealt with, but they try to use it in a funny spinoff about pizza, uh, and it was terrible because you're basically joking about domestic abuse. So uh, before you post, you know, look into what you're, the hashtag you're using. Uh, it might be taken already, um, and again, you could be associating yourself with something you don't want to be. And then as you build your brand, you get big, like the Jono or you know the other ones that that have kind of messed up. You know, you're just you're more in the spotlight, so you just have to be careful. Um, be really careful with um, abbreviations and acronyms, no. too. Um, if you are at like the National Producers Conference and put NPC, you might get the National Proctologist Conference. Mm -hmm. I'm not being funny. They, these yeah. are real examples. And, uh, and some of them can send you on to really weird spaces. So just uh, be careful on abbreviations. I've, I've got somebody getting the chuckles here. Do, do you have an example? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it is. that's a really good point, though. Uh, like, you know, I not to go on a complete tangent. Don't be scared. This is supposed to be fun. Like I said before, it's a cocktail party, being run by a a, a, a thing that's supposed that that's acting like a television. Like, enjoy the space, have fun with the space. Just be careful. 
Yeah, be cautious. And then the <laughs> example that I that we talked about, but I've given it in conferences is Justine Seiko. I don't know if you guys heard of that, but when she hashtag, she left um, the UK to go to Africa and she decided to say, I hope I don't get AIDS on her way to Africa. Bef as she landed, she was already fired. The PR got a hold of her. The news just tore her apart. Uh, her Twitter just blew up. She only had 100 followers and thought no one was paying attention. Oh, it's just a dumb comment. And I read some of the other things she had posted. I mean, she just, she let her mouth run wild. And after that, I mean, her web, if you look at her, the website under her name, it's, it's all for AIDS to Africa. It's a fundraiser. So be careful what you post. Yes, you can have fun with it, but please be cautious. It could blow up in your face. Yeah, and I think also be cautious when you are, if you do schedule tweets or posts, because <laughs> you can inadvertently, you can schedule a, a tweet, say, that makes sense at the time that you schedule it, but before it actually posts, something happens that is going to influence the content of that post. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Joan Rivers preloaded a uh, branded tweet uh, like four days before she died. Uh, and like a tweet went out advertising something she had a product placement with like after she died and people were like that's a little creepy <laughs> that's a lot creepy actually <laughs> but like tweeting from beyond the grave but uh <laughs> so i hope that doesn't happen to right. anyone here but like you know there's another example of uh sort of twitter fail right well yeah, hashtag yeah. twitter fail and so once, once we get through the five things that you should be doing, maybe we can also talk about some things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> I think we're covering those pretty yeah, well organically. We yes. <laughs> um, so number five is basically how do you keep up with what's new in, in the social media space? You know, there's constantly new things coming along and how do you decide, as we've been talking about, where your audience is, where it's going to be in the future because a lot of times, when new platforms come along, they become really popular for a week and then they go away. Or there's the one that becomes really popular and sticks around. And if you had been sort of first in there, you'd have a competitive advantage. You attend Hall of Fame sessions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you really research. Um, if, if, especially if you're using curation um, websites, that's, I follow social media um, social media sites, like the Scoop It is just a great example. It curates social media articles that are happening all over the world. And so I'm getting up to date information every day. So if that's something you're interested in, that is a great way to stay up to speed. And I mean, you've got so many, Mashable is really good with social media articles and it just kind of gives you, if you just want the broad idea of what's going on, that's a really great source that gives you the easy stuff right away if you want to get deeper. There's other articles and other journals that are specifically related to social media and what's the next big thing that's happening or what small businesses have come out that are trying to compete with Facebook or other giants. So that's a great way to try to stay on top of it. I think it's a matter of just paying attention. Um, this past, got three weeks, everybody's crazy about Meerkat, the live streaming, uh, uh, Twitter-based live streaming. It's very cool, um, and I'm eager to see where it goes, but that's this week's conversation point. And a few months ago, there was one Ello, uh, I don't know, did anybody here get Ello invites? And then a few months before that, there was another one. A few months before that, there was another one. Take them all at like sort of face value, look at them, digest them, see how they're trending. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? And latch onto them as appropriate. Um, she's right though, everybody should have a LinkedIn page, um, especially if you ever want to be gainfully employed. Um, and something that he said, when Pinterest came out, I remember getting an invite from a friend through Facebook and she said, you know, I know that you would love this site. I craft a lot and I do a lot of things on the side. And so she's like, this would be really great for you and for your photography and all this other stuff that you do. I'm like, eh, I don't want to do this. And so she's like, just try it. Just look at it. And you had to be, it was by invite only at that time. And so I did it three months, uh, Pinterest was three months old. And when I did it, I was like, I don't even understand what this platform is. And she's like, it's a virtual pin board. I said, that makes no sense. I don't understand. Why don't I just have a normal pin board at home. <laughs> so it didn't make sense to me. And then they just started improving. And then I started seeing it and I started getting the hang of it. And then it started growing and more people were talking about it. It was predominantly women-based at that time. I mean, it's still, they're the majority that are on it. And 
it just became this fascinating site where you just put a bunch of things that you hope for and you try to shop virtually in your mind. So it's just, you know, it's one of those things that it really caught on and it has a very specific audience, very specific demographic. I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon, but it's not, it's not a site or a platform that all of you guys would be on. It doesn't always make sense. So again, you just, you test it out. I mean, MySpace came out and I was like, yay, MySpace. And then Facebook came out and I was like, I don't think I like you. I'm one of those. I'm not an early adopter, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and so in college, you can only be a college student. And I was like, I'll test it out, but it's ugly. You can't personalize it. You can't do any of this stuff. And so, I, but I still did it because everybody was doing it. I was like, well, let's see what's going to catch on. And it did. I don't even know how to log into my MySpace anymore to just delete the whole account. So it's still in space somewhere. Um, but, but that's kind of how you go through these, you know, different, whoops through these different platforms. Things come out all the time, test it. If you don't like it, delete it. It happens all the time. Yeah, and I, um, Pinterest in particular has been really kind of fascinating to follow because uh, for a while, and, and I wish this was a stereotype, it was a lot of kittens and cupcakes. Mm -hmm. For a very long time, that's what it was. And it has evolved into something awesome. A every time I tried to pitch, to people, let's do something on Pinterest, everybody would give me the kittens and cupcakes line. That, I, that, that's not my own, uh, mind you, but like, I think it's awesome what they've done yeah, now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think right now we're just, you focus on the big three, the big four, um, and then as you have time, again, it's, it's your time management that's gonna make you available to uh, experiment with other social media sites. Um, I think one thing I didn't hit on was, um, social media management tools, kind of like Hootsuite. Mm -hmm. um, something, it's a one-stop shop where you can manage all your social media profiles you know, uh, in one website. Um, that can make you, your brand, your business a lot more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something, you know, obviously, that would make you more open to using new tools uh, without sacrificing all the time. Great, thank you. Um, so earlier this afternoon, we did some uh, social media branding reviews for some students. And um, one of the things I think that we saw consistently coming up there was how to differentiate from yourself as yourself personally, yourself professionally, and then if you have a business also, um, can, can we have a conversation about that? Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll sort of kick this off, and I really do apologize to my fellow panelists because this will be probably the sixth time you've heard this joke today. <laughs> and basically, I have a personal um, social media life, and I have a professional social media life, and I try not to mix the two. My Twitter feed, and you're all welcome to follow it, is um, mostly angry rants about college football. Um, I'm a journalist. I spend all day doing that. I spend all day digesting news. If I'm at an event like this or at the ONA conference or something, I'll talk about the news. But mostly that's my space to retweet things I find interesting, uh, talk about college football, and uh, post pictures of my puppy. And you know what? That's perfectly OK. Mm -hmm. Because in the little bio section I put, this is my personal account. For my work account, go here. Uh, I put up walls to separate them. Um, my Facebook account is not a publicly facing one. One of my colleagues has 47,000 people following him on Facebook, and he likes that. Uh, and I like to keep my Facebook network closed to mm -hmm. people I know. So everybody's got to figure it out for themselves and what you're comfortable putting out into a public sphere. Because remember, this is a public sphere. So just find your own comfort level and if you want to have your business space and you want to have your personal space, make two accounts. It's perfectly reasonable. Um, the other thing is uh, just be really mindful of which account you're on at any given point because, yeah, um, just that you don't accidentally post, you know, pictures of my puppy to, you know, 27 million followers on the, on the BBC corporate accounts. And worse things have happened. Yeah. People that have done that. So um, I agree. And I think balance is everything and deciding which which social media sites you're going to use for a personal. If you want to mix it, then make sure it's allocated to your brand. Make sure that is your brand and you're not taking it out of hand um, and that you're just staying true to it. For example, he said he likes his dog and he is for People know what they're going there for. And that's kind of the key. Um, and so I, I do a very similar thing. My Facebook is closed. 
and you know, I kind of limit it to 400 and I delete every year. If you're not really my friend, I delete them. <laughs> so I, that's what I choose to do, but my Pinterest is open, my Instagram's open, my Twitter's open. And each of those have their own kind of different branding to themselves. That's something I've chosen to do. Some people are like, I want to be an open book. Great, make sure employers, just know that employers are watching. Yeah. So if you want to be an open book, that's great. But there, you may be posting things that are inappropriate for future jobs. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you decide to venture into the I'm completely open or if you decide to segregate and what you're going to be putting where. And this morning, uh, this morning's big panel, I told a, st sorry. I told a story about um, a friend of mine who was hiring someone who, um, for a strategic communications job, who had a very raunchy Facebook page that uh, had drug paraphernalia all over it. And it was public. And um, he got over it because he had an interview uh, with, the, with the woman and she was very qualified and very good, but his bosses wouldn't go for the hire because it was a strategic communications job and she didn't know enough to make that private. You know, everybody's allowed to have their private life, right. but you gotta be really smart. And especially if you're going for a strategic communications job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it just depends on how much time you want to put into social media. Um, you know, Facebook allows you to have a personal and a business page. Google allows you to have the personal and a business page. Um, so you can separate it uh, pretty easily on both platforms. Um, but it just depends how much time you want to put into content on on each one. You know, how how, uh, how much you want to build your brand. If your brand is more important than your personal, um, again, you just kind of got to weigh it out. And that's really, that's sort of the key to the whole thing. Like the worst thing you can do is set up something for your brand and update once a month. Mm -hmm. When everybody was really first getting into blogs and uh, blogger.com and uh, the f first iterations of Tumblr, I remember reading the blogs and fully half of what I read from people was, so sorry I haven't updated in so mm -hmm. long. You don't want to be that. Don't be that. <laughs> Just <laughs> if you're going to commit to being on the platform, commit to being on the platform. Make it a steady, regular stream of information. Yeah. Yeah. Google, um, as far as an SEO perspective, uh, Google just updated their their algorithm recently that now it incorporates uh, likes, shares, comments. It incorporates engagement that you receive on social media and helps your website or your brand uh, organically. So the more that people are hitting you up on, on social media, the better your website will actually do in, in organic search rankings. So it, it kind of all comes together in the end. Yeah. Great, thanks. So again, let's fo focus on students as personal brands. Um, you know, it's sometimes difficult when you don't have a lot of real experience doing what you want to do, um, but you may have other experience. So how would you deal with that it, within your social media profile. So, you know, that may be LinkedIn especially, but that may be in other social media platforms as well. I love something Glenn said earlier, and he's checking his Twitter now. Um, he said something along I the lines am, of actually. As, <laughs> aspire to be a recording artist, aspire to be a media strategist. You can say that stuff and you can be safe. And I love that. I loved hearing that. I was like, absolutely. If you guys are not that yet, I tell our students, I was like, you're not students. You're media strategists that happen to be in school to continue your knowledge of the, you know, of what it is that you're learning. You guys need to know that you guys are professionals already. If you have that in your mindset, you're going to go into it as such, and you're going to perform as such on social media. So understanding that as a student, put your stuff out there. Make sure that you allow your instructors to see it first and say, yes, you're good to go. Put this out there. That way, you're proud of your work, but make sure it's to the level that you're really going to want employers to see it. But LinkedIn is such an asset for every single person here. It doesn't matter that you're a student. You can put what you aspire to be as your position. You know, and I can't tell you how many people get recruited off of LinkedIn. I get, I constantly get emails. Hey, are you interested in this position? No. Are you interested? No. And they're great positions. I just love my job. But you, you, you will get recruited on there if you have everything updated the way it should be. Yeah. You, you're in school and um, you're creating your portfolio. Each month you go along, you're adding mm -hmm. a piece. Um, LinkedIn allows you to add portfolio pieces to your, portfo uh, to your profile. So, I mean, right there, you don't have the experience, but you have something that shows this is what I can do. Um, it may help you get consulting jobs on the side. You know, it may help you get an internship. Uh, but again, it's still, even though you don't have the experience, mm -hmm. you still have little pieces uh, 
that you can show showing off what one just sort of generic yeah. piece of advice I have for LinkedIn is um, if you're particularly certified or competent mm -hmm. or smart on a particular piece of software, uh, put that in your LinkedIn yeah. profile. People will actively search for, um, you know, the jump from Final, um, Final Cut 7 to Final Cut X, like really through a lot of professional editors for a loop. And there are people right now who are looking for Final Cut, um, people trained on Final Cut X. So like, uh, that could be like they just go into Orlando FCPX editors, boom, mm -hmm. they'll find you. Don't just put, I'm an editor, uh, I'm a student editor at Full Sail. No, give them a little more. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's people whose sole job is to just go on LinkedIn and recruit. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, hopefully you guys understand what needs to be on there needs to be professional. That is not Snapchat, that is not Facebook, that is not anything except a professional platform for you guys to expose yourselves to as media professionals, whatever field you guys have chosen. Yeah, I saw somebody's um, LinkedIn profile today and uh, it had certifications from Linda. Mm -hmm. So I know you guys all have access to Linda, but it was just a class they took um, and they got certified. And it just, it was five you know, certifications from Linda. It was awesome. I've never seen uh, you know, Linda certification and anything, but you know, uh, I know what Linda is and I know, you know, it's a great tool for you guys. So, mm -hmm. you know, right off the bat, you don't have to be Adobe certified in, in this or Google Analytics certified. You know, they have small little stuff you can do within Linda that still gives you kind of credibility. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Um, yeah, yeah, move along. Yeah, I think adding to that on, on the LinkedIn thing, it's important for you to use the right words. So, you know, uh, as an SEO person, Lucas would call them keywords, but not everybody understands that concept necessarily. But a keyword w would be what you type into Google if you were looking for something. It would be what a recruiter would type in LinkedIn when they were looking for something. If you don't have the right words in your profile, yeah. they're not going to find you. And the way to find the right words to put in your profile is to look at job postings for the job you want to have. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I've heard several times from students who say, I, I don't need to have a LinkedIn profile because I'm gonna work for myself. Well, that's all well and good, but you know things may not work out and you may need to get a J-O-B, <laughs> um, but you also may need that for, for clients, yeah. right? Yeah. To, to give you some credibility so they know yeah. what you are capable of doing. And, and take advantage of all of the features that LinkedIn has. You can add the courses that you're taking as you go through the program, a certifications is a great idea. You can add portfolio pieces. You can um, get in groups that are relevant to what you're interested in doing. So if you have not really fully fleshed out your LinkedIn profile, I encourage you to yeah. do that this weekend after Hall of Fame is over. <laughs> so we have just a few minutes left. So I'm just going to kind of open it up to the panelists to see if you have anything else that you feel like we haven't discussed that would be helpful. We've covered, uh, between the various sessions today, we've covered a lot of bases. And I think, um, I'm just gonna reiterate a point that I made this morning that um, my hope, my aspiration is that this is a brand extension for the place I work and we can do great journalism on social platforms. We're not totally there yet, but we've had a lot of really cool experiments. Think about that notion of like, rather than it just being a brand extension or a means for promotion, think about what you can do within the space, the way the space is right now, for whatever it is, whether you're an audio engineer, whether you're a musician, whether you're a video producer, um, journalist, PR person, whatever it is, think about the space, take a step back and think about how you can do something really cool in the space, as if like it's, Again, 1957, everybody's just getting their TV sets in their houses. I might be way off on the timelines then, but everybody's first getting their first uh, TV sets or their first color TVs, and you have the opportunity to be a producer. This is the 21st century version of everybody getting a TV set. Go, create. That's good. Great, all right, thank you. All right, so um, at this time we're going to uh, take a few questions from those of you who have tweeted your questions to Full Sail On Air. Um, so let's ask just one panelist to answer each of those. Um, so Janelle, how can I, Austin Thomas asks, how can I increase my number of followers without spamming? 
Well, it, again, it depends on what platform he's talking about. Um, but if you're looking at Twitter, it all goes back to, on all of them, it actually goes to back to engagement. If you guys start following people who are industry experts, and so whatever, Austin, whatever you're posting, um, whatever your brand is, follow others that you would love to see them follow you. So maybe they have a larger reach than you do. Engage with them because those followers will in turn see your followers and they're going to want to follow you if you're posting like-minded things. Um, with Facebook, everything has to do with you know, engagement and content and who you know. If your friends are doing it, it's a lot harder to engage on Facebook because people don't necessarily go to pages. So that's kind of a, a trickier thing. But with Twitter, it's definitely on engaging with the other side as well, not waiting for them to come to you because you're posting these really cool things. You can be posting the best stuff, but if you're not posting it the right way and you're not engaging with people, no one's going to see it. All right. So, Lucas, um, what techniques would efficiently be used for applying social media in an advertising job position comes from Darren Wilson. Um, Darren, I would just say know your audience. Um, research your audience because uh, there's great tools out there that you can um, target geographically, demographically, so you're not wasting advertising dollars on a general mass marketing campaign. Um, if you just want to target Winter Park, Orlando, you can get as big and small as you want. Um, males, females, I mean, you can really uh, hone in on who um, your demographic uh, and your target clientele is um, so that you can monetize uh, you know, what you're doing and you can have a better ROI return on investment. Great, thanks Lucas. And I have an actual, uh, a, a funny story about somebody who was looking for a job in advertising. And he went out and he bought AdWords ads for the main executives' names of the advertising firm he wanted to work for because he knew they were going to Google themselves at some point. And when they did, his ad came up and it said, hey, you should hire me. <laughs> Brilliant. He yeah. got the job? He did. Good. He did. <laughs> Pretty smart. All right. So, Glenn, Austin Thomas asks, in reference to employers looking at employees' social media accounts, how safe are privacy settings? Um, I don't know, um, but uh, I know that it's important to um, the industry. So uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, um, pretty good. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> can, nope. I, can I answer a little bit? Absolutely. OK. Um, it may be set to private, but you never know who's screenshotting something that you've posted and sharing that on their own, especially if they don't care that you've set it to private. And I know that this has happened in Snapchat. You think something's private between someone, and they can screenshot it and share it. So, so it just depends on who you have following you. I'd still be a little cautious, but if you trust the people who are following you and you know them, um, then I'd be safe. But if not, if you're just kind of opening it up and just setting it to private based on whoever you want to enter, you never know who's really taking that stuff. So you can. I mean, just a share in general takes it out of your privacy. It does. And moves it to somebody who might be in public. So, um, yeah, it's. Yeah. I it's never, never safe. Know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would always assume that everything you put online is publicly accessible. And I, I told the story earlier today that. Um, I know someone who is a mature, responsible professional who went on a little Facebook rant uh, about his boss and sort of quickly realized that was a dumb idea. But in the intervening time, somebody took a screenshot of it. And so, you know, even though you think it's private right. or even though you delete it, it may not be gone. You should assume it lives out there forever. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I don't know that anyone can answer this question, but uh, so I'll just open it to all of you. Illy Bishop asks, why does Instagram not want to use backlinks? I just think that's not what it was originally intended to do. And uh, a certain population of their users really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Instagram's a very cool space. I really want to see where, uh, where, where it goes. Um, and for them, the, the value right now is to continue to be this photo sharing space. Um, you know, um, in a lot of ways, <clears throat> they're sort of uh, embracing their role as not the link back people. Yeah. You know, the, um, and their users more operatively are embracing that role of not being link back or not being over commercialized. And um, 
Yeah, uh, it's a very cool space, and it sort of turns, it's turning the, the model on its head. I mean, like, mm -hmm. the notion that, that you can have a social media space that doesn't link back, that's... And the fascinating part is that you can be posting, it almost looks like a portfolio or a profile of everything you love and are, and there's only one place people can go to see more about you, and that's if you put a website in your description. Yeah. And so that's kind of the cool part about Instagram, but I agree. I hope Facebook never changes that about Instagram, um, just for profit or whatever it is that they would want to do it for, because that is kind of the, the beauty of Instagram and what it was originally for. Yeah. It's just for images and hashtag and be able to find things within that platform. As seemingly frustrating as it is, I really respect them for it. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll As a guy who, who managing social media accounts, it's a little frustrating, but yeah. it's, a, it's a, uh, I'd, I'd love to do things on there. And journalism outlets are doing cool things on there. Um, and just speaking to, to my part of the industry and brands are doing cool things on there. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Great, okay. Well, that sort of leads into our next question, which I will again open to all of you. Devin Welshie asks, of all the social media methods, which site do you believe will survive the longest as what it is right now? Twitter. Uh, a friendster? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. We all have different answers. <laughs> friendster, Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn. No, I think, I, uh, frankly, I, I Nothing is shocking anymore. You know, um, uh, um, brands disappear all the time. I lived in, uh, I spent most of my youth in New York City and um, the, around New York City and the uh, Pan Am building, it's this iconic building in Midtown. And then Pan Am went out of business. Now, like anybody who's like a historian, the, the notion that Pan American Airlines would go out of business and the building would change their naming rights is shocking. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I think it was a um, uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Pan Am appeared in the logos on the, in the in the space stations. So, like, nothing would surprise me that any of these would potentially go go the way of the dodo bird but with that said i think they're all constantly evolving mm -hmm. and what we know as facebook today what we know as twitter today is what we know as instagram youtube g plus today might not look at all that way in five years 10 years 15. go back to the first facebook yeah i don't think we'd even recognize it yeah no. well, i think i think linkedin has just hit a, such a niche mm. uh market that um you know with facebook you have a generation currently who are getting off because Parents, parents, grandparents, grandparents <laughs> everybody's on there. So, you know, you're going to have a declining number. Eventually, you know, it's going to start going down because people are going to start dying out, right? Um, but that same generation that hates Facebook are still going to jump on LinkedIn because as they mature, it becomes a professional platform. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that one's going to stand. Yeah, there are definitely generational differences in social media. Oh, yeah. I, I read something the other day where there was a major U.S. retailer who tweeted a photo of the space shuttle Challenger exploding on July 4th because the social media manager wasn't born then and didn't know what that was a picture of. Oh, wow. So there's a, also another social media fail, by the way. Wow. Um, Roosevelt Goodson asks, wondering about tips on catching the eyes of individuals that you are trying to build a professional relationship with. That's not... Uh, you know, LinkedIn does put up this barrier that, like, do you actually know this person? Like, when you put in a request. Uh, so sometimes that's a little bit harder. I don't mind connecting with professional people if they have a presence on Twitter. On Twitter, it's a really great way to start a professional relationship by starting a conversation. And if you follow each other, you can move it over to the, the direct message space. And, and, and Twitter's less formal than LinkedIn yeah, is, absolutely. so it's a better place to do that. I'm, I'm telling you, this last panelist got her job talking about cartoons and music. She's a blogger. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think with Twitter, all, anything can go because it's a little bit more casual. Yeah, and I think on Twitter, they don't necessarily have to connect back to you if, if they don't want. Right. Yeah. So it's, it is less. They can even reply back to you but not follow you. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and, and a, 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 it's an ability to keep a certain amount of professional distance. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I, I once um, posted something on Twitter because I was trying to connect with this particular SEO, and I said, "Does Aaron, anyone know at sign Aaron Wall?" And 
he was paying attention to that and he mm. responded back to me. So very cool. That is cool. Yeah. Um, Cassandra Korea asks, from an artist point of view, do you think it's okay to post both recent works and past works, even if you feel they may not be the best? Absolutely. Get it out there. Be, be, be part of the zeitgeist. Uh, put something out there. Absolutely. And I'd be particularly intrigued if it's older work to see your evolution as an artist. Yeah. I think there was a there was a, a portfolio I was put on. I'm not sure which which platform, but it was uh, somebody's evolution in writing, starting from like middle school all the way up to college. And they went to you know an art school, uh, and it was awesome to see that evolution of you know drawing in, in middle school and all the way up. So. And that's great. Just make sure that people know that that's older work and that yeah. you're not quite at, that that's not where you're at anymore. <laughs> that's what I would say, just to clarify where you're at. But if you're not proud of it, don't post it. That's kind of how I see it. But if you are, and or you'd like to do like an evolution piece, like this is where I was kind of thing, I think that's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also want to um, call attention, I, I'm very good friends, lifelong friends with an artist who puts this whole process online. Um, like how he comes up with an idea, um, how he does time lapses of his paintings. I I, I'm just really cool stuff. So if, if this is specifically a person mm -hmm. talking about their artwork, um, there's a whole rich space for that, not just on social media, but on the web in general. Um, check this guy out. It's uh, B-O-R-B-A-Y.com, Borbay.com. Great, thank you. Um, Jessica Jardin asks, any additional tips on how to provide relevant input to conversations that are archived or slightly outdated? Say that one more time. Um, additional tips on how to provide relevant input to conversations that are archived or slightly outdated. I think the only way to do that is to connect it to something that's going on now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the only way to do it. Um, you know, I was here a few years ago and Gary Rizzo was on this stage, so if I was going to talk about being here, I'd be like, I'm sitting in the seat Gary Rizzo sat in. Yeah. Like, that's a way to connect to an archive material. Yeah. Make, like your earlier story, just make it relevant to something now that you can tie it back to. Yeah. Okay. Austin Gilstrap asks, is clout a good resource for finding things like articles to post to social media sites? I... I hate clout. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't want to go that far. Like, people cite clout scores to me a lot. Um, what are you saying for, for articles, for content? Uh, yeah, I, I don't get it. No. Uh, I, I, I'm not on board on it. I'm not going to poo-poo it and say that it doesn't have value because they have their metrics and they have, they have their rationale for coming up with the numbers they come up with, but I just, it's not part of my working day. Yeah, I mean, for the clout score, cool. I mean, it may help you somewhere, you know, LinkedIn, you can post that on there, but as far as content curation, uh, I, I, I've used it, I think it's pretty terrible. Mm. Yeah, and, and you can use a lot of different yeah, tools. Yeah, Bazumo, um, Bazumo's awesome. I mean, you got good content there. And if you're following the right people on Twitter, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a good a lot of good content from there, yeah. too. All right, uh, Dubraska Lima asks, I've been tweeting in Spanish for five years. Do I risk my followers if I start to tweet in English? Should I be so worried? Do Spanglish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de depending on the followers, but yeah, yeah, yeah I would. I would. Yeah, it, it all depends on your audience. Um, we have uh, BBC Mundo, which is our Spanish language service, and I sometimes retweet BBC Mundo or our uh, BBC Mundo Washington correspondent, a great guy named uh, Thomas Sparrow. I'll retweet them in Spanish, and um, I'll forget that my audience doesn't necessarily speak Spanish, and sometimes they write me back nasty grams. <laughs> and uh, I honestly don't care um, because it's uh, it, this is great journalism and it's a Spanish language thing and you're going to get nasty grams regardless. But I think um, it, it, think, and think about your audience. If they're mm -hmm. going to be upset by it, maybe not do it. But I'd create a new Twitter handle that would be similar, if, especially if the audience is nobody's going to understand it. If she's carrying through a bilingual audience that would totally understand that transition or even add a Spanglish mix to it, great. If you're going to lose your audience, don't risk it. Start a new handle and do that all in English. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so there are two questions that relate to Twitter. The first one, Austin Biggs asks, how does someone who has never used Twitter embrace the powers of 140 character branding statements? And the second one is, how do we grasp larger audiences with social platforms that li limit the characters used from J. Miles? Uh, the, they're essentially asking the, the same question, which is, how do I get over that getting started on Twitter anxiety? Mm -hmm. And I think the easiest way to do that is just to do it. 
just to do it, start the conversation, see what's trending, join a conversation, and hope for the best and hope that you start interacting with people. I do know someone who has a tremendous Twitter following and her strategy is to see whatever the top 10 trending things in the country are right now and write 30 tweets on each one and she gets thousands of followers a day. I would not recommend that. Um, it, it, she, she, but she does have a huge following, so, and a very high clout score. And I think limiting to 140 characters is something that Twitter has done really good on staying firm about. And it helps us as communicators to be concise in what we're trying to say. And when we're trying to fill in, you know, on Facebook, paragraph after paragraph, it's not an essay, it's not a blog. That's why this is called a micro blog. So I think it challenges your communication skills, which is great practice on how to get to the point fast. Yeah, we have short attention spans. Mm -hmm. You know, we want you know, something to be quick yeah, and to the not point. have to read the whole thing, so. Yeah. Uh, but don't get caught in the, like, acronym bingo uh, um, trap either. Oh, no. Of just writing in acronyms and just writing U's for you. like. Try to use real English yeah. as uh, to the, the mm -hmm. or real Spanish as the case might be, um, to, to communicate. Um, because that also becomes incredibly annoying to read. Yeah. And don't use symbols um, unless they're a hashtag. Uh, we saw some where like the at is the A sign when it's not used appropriately as an actual handle. Mm -hmm. um, nobody likes exclamation points as ones or eyes. So just stick to normal, basic alphabet. You'll, and it, you'll be all right. It's a really easy way to lose a potential person mm -hmm. for engagement is to come off to hip. Hmm. <laughs> Says the guy who wishes he still had a friend's turn. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, a great point that you made earlier too was about the uh, the underscore mm -hmm. with the uh, the Twitter handle. Um, takes what, what you can go ahead and repeat. I, I just, it, it takes three menus on, oh, sorry, it takes three menus uh, on the I, typical iPhone keyboard to get to the underscore. Why would you put the underscore? It just makes it harder to find you. Uh, if someone has taken your name, if you have a common name, come up with something cool. Uh, one of my colleagues, her name's Jane O'Brien, which is about as generic as you get. So her Twitter account is the Welsh word for wind, which is trewent. And she kind of owns at Trewent. I think it's awesome. She's branded herself as Trewent. You know. <laughs> T-R-O-W-Y-N-T. <laughs> hmm, OK. Um, Nicole Galarza asks, if YouTube is a top social networking platform, how should it be used? As a video blog, maybe? As a blog. A, a video blog's great. Um, I would add tutorials. Tutorials yeah. do incredibly well on YouTube. Facebook and YouTube have a battle going on right now with videos because Facebook likes to have their own videos and not link it back to YouTube. Um, but Facebook is great. If you guys watch anything on Facebook, it's usually under a minute and it's usually funny quick snippets and they usually go by fast, two at most. Where YouTube, the longevity is usually in tutorials, in long videos. I have a nephew who watches Minecraft and they're like three hours long. But, and, and so know your industry. I would not sit through a three hour video, but gamers would to learn all the things you guys like to learn about that stuff. But th the longevity of those videos, that will not fly on Facebook, but that will fly on YouTube. So definitely in tutorials. Uh, in the last session, I talked about one of my uh, previous clients was Runner's World and we did human interest stories, we did, all these like in-depth analysis of major running events. Um, we created great videos, but the number one video on the site forever and always will be how to tie your shoes. Um, so I mean, like how to's go a really long way. And then mm -hmm. there's the other example of the, there's um, this quote unquote family business where a woman where you only see from here down on her arms unwraps brand new toys and plays with them on camera. She's making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on YouTube doing this. So like how to, absolutely, or uh, anything demonstrative or anything learning. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, so there's one more thing that we should, we should consider doing on social media, and that's the mandatory selfie in front of the <laughs> awesome wholesale students. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here, I'll do, I'll, I'll do you yeah, guys over here. All right. Sorry, camera people. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> All right, guys. Gosh. 
<laughs> all right. <laughs> I got you all on a panoramic earlier. <laughs> got it. All right, all right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there we go. You there we go. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> beauty, beauty, beauty. Terrible. All right. <laughs> The people filming this hate me now, but I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for attending our session today, everyone. Thank you, guys. We especially want to thank our guests, Lucas, Janelle, and Glenn. Have a great rest of your evening, and enjoy the last day of Hall of Fame. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought somebody was going to ask that question. Renzel asks, how does one restart their Twitter feed without deleting it and w wanting to keep your followers, I grew up a lot over five years. Wow, good question. Um, you know what? If you've taken a break and you want to restart, um, maybe one of the 
Um, you won't lose your followers if you change your handle, I'm pretty sure. So that might be a good way to start it. Um, and, you know, if there's space between your last tweet and now, just uh, let everybody know, hey, this is the new me. We're getting started again today. Even put that in your bio. Definitely changing your bio is yeah. a good start. Change your bio, change your picture, change your heading. Just, you know, kind of revamp your whole thing if you definitely don't want to lose those followers. That's what I would recommend. If not, start from scratch. All right, Ivan asks, do you believe following random people expecting a follow back is an effective way to increase my following? No, no, not at all. Uh, again, you, you're trying to engage, and that's you know the, what we spoke about earlier is, is engaging. So if you follow somebody, engage with them. Um, ask them a question, get to know what they're about, um, and engage with them. And then obviously through that engagement, you can possibly get that follow back. There's a lot of reciprocity in Twitter. So if you follow, people are more inclined to follow back, but especially if you engage with them. Um, and let me look at the question. And following random people is not going to get you anywhere because they're not going to follow you back, especially if you're talking about things that they have no interest in. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're following people that you actually want to follow because if not, you're going to get a feed that's going to be absolutely boring to you if you're just picking random people. Yeah, during the session, I, during the session, I called it a cocktail party. Um, do you really want to go to a cocktail party with random people? Yeah. You, you, you got to have some sort of similar interest or some talking point. Otherwise, it's it's the digital equivalent of standing around in a, in a room full of people you don't know with nothing to talk about. Great, thank you. All right, Natalie asks, there's been talk that social media platforms ultimately have rights to any work you post, such as artwork and design concepts, and can use it however they'd like. Is this true? And before anyone answers, I'll preface their answer by saying none of us are legal experts, so you should take that as just what we believe to be true. I believe that the answer is no, they don't have any legal rights, but I am not an attorney, so I can't specifically say that. Uh, I'm not an attorney, but I do know that the social platforms do make great efforts to protect copyright. I know, for example, YouTube, extraordinary efforts to correct uh, to um, to uh, protect copyright, and uh, it's I've actually been uh, trained up on some of the uh, the ways that they do, and it, it's impressive. So that's just one example. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, and that ends the questions. So thank you all for being here this evening. We hope that you enjoyed the the session, and we hope that you'll attend some more sessions later. Have a great night. Yeah.